Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 264, featuring the first in a two-part interview series with Yuho Salola, one of the co-founders of Almost Human. Now, this is the company responsible for the Legend of Grimrock games. As you probably know, I was a big fan of the first one, uh, reviewed it uh, back when it came out, and they've uh, just recently released a second game uh, that's even better, in my opinion, and many others than the first. Anyway, I wanted to sit down with Yuho and talk about the game and uh, his background and the background of the rest of the team. It's a very small uh, indie team uh, putting these games out. It's a pretty cool story. Uh, but anyway, we've got a lot to cover, so without further ado, here is Yuho Salola. All right, folks, I am here with Yuho Salola, the co-founder and emperor of Almost Human Games, a company responsible for, as you can see from his shirt there. By the way, I want one of those shirts. Uh, the Legend of Grimrock series. So, how are you doing, uh, Yuho? Good, good. It's, it's something like 4 p.m. here, and uh, I guess it's a bit earlier in there. Yeah, it's just turned 8 a.m. here, but... I was uh, I noticed that you're from Finland, and I was yeah. thinking a little bit about Finland, and I think that your climate there is pretty much the same as it is here in Minnesota, right? So, yeah, I, I, I suppose it's winter is coming. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that probably starts to fall around December for you, and yeah, sticks around till March. So yeah, yeah, You've got a lot of time to get cozy with a game like Legend of Grimrock. What about the Finland? game scene is there a lot of developers there or are you kind of a lonely <laughs> studio or what no no there's a lot of a lot of stuff like um just to name drop some there's rovio with them birds uh supercell the highest grossing game company uh at least in here they do lots of tasks uh, and uh remedy so um, frozen by the nose, guys. There's really active, active, active um, game scene here here in uh, Espoo and Helsinki. So you didn't have any any problems getting your games exported to the U.S. and on Steam and all that. No, uh, it's 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 good. It's it's easy. So your background, you uh, started off as a graphics guy and an artist, right? Yeah, yeah. I was um, uh, before we started the company. I was in uh, Future Mark doing the benchmark softwares with only one of the other co-founders, and uh, uh, the other two guys are uh, from Remedy. They did the uh, Max Payne and Alan Wake. So Antti and Petri came from there. Uh, Antti was. Uh, environment artist and uh, Petri was the uh, programmer there doing the 3D engine. So basically we, we knew each other uh, back in the days and uh, uh, just wanted to give it a go. So you guys are old friends then. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And uh, Oli, Oli and Petri go like way back into childhood and uh, but the uh, Scenes really small here, so everybody knows each other. So that that way we got to got together. Uh, you did some work on Shattered Horizon, right? Yeah. What kind of uh, what was the nature of that? Um, what kind of work did you do on it? I did the astronaut and some of the environment stuff, and uh, I guess I did the um, some of the cinematics and stuff like that so uh, you know like all around graphics guy designing stuff and weapons and uh, stuff like that so not are you doing all the uh, character modeling and all that stuff for the grimrock series now yeah basically i did all the 3d graphics in the first one and uh i got uh we hired some help help for me we expanded our graphics department to two guys Wow, so, doubled it. <laughs> yeah, so I got, uh, we had this talented guy called Yuri, Yuri Ullakko, and uh, he's an old colleague from 
uh, also from the future mark and uh, uh, I guess Antti knows him from school, high school or something like that. So uh, we kind of split the uh, workload uh, on the Grimrock 2 between us. So we kind of could do double the amount of content <laughs> in Grimrock 2 compared to 1. Plus we had a double of time, so I guess we quadrupled the content. Yeah, I gotta say, I've been playing it pretty much non-stop every chance I get since I first got it, but you know, it's been a while since I played the first one, so I was just going to ask, you know, what, what is new in, in the second one? Uh, basically, everything is new. Um, the m movement is the same, but we, we try to um, improve every aspect of the game uh, con uh, throughout every, every feature. The main thing probably is the most noticeable is the uh, outside environments and uh, um, the that's beautiful settings. I, that's the that's one thing I noticed right away is that you're on this tropical island at the beginning. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a bit different to start to the game, and uh, one one big thing, thing was um, the levels inside the levels. So you get multiple levels inside the uh, one level, and uh, um, the skill system got tweaked quite a much. I think in the better direction. So you say multiple levels within the level. You mean that the first one didn't have different stories of uh, dungeons? Yeah, yeah the, the levels were kind of flat. Now, now you can uh, climb ladders uh, up and down and jump into uh, shallow pits and stuff like that, or in the river. Yeah, that so damn river, man. Time. That damn underwater <laughs> dam, the, dude. Those, those turtles. <laughs> <laughs> so we didn't have anything like that. So that that's something that really really uh, improved the level design uh, complexity also. So we could uh, take ad advantage uh, of the levels in the uh, puzzle design and stuff like that. Somebody had asked me about the dungeon editor. I don't I didn't write down the, the name, but yeah, you know, I think you had the dungeon editor for the first game too, right? Or is it yeah. something new for the second we, one? We added it a bit later because um, we did Grimrock 1 with text editor basically. So um, dungeons were basically done like it's, it, it was rows of hashtags and uh, 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 where there was uh, like a dot, there was a uh, or, or line of dots, then it was um, th there was the, the corridor, but now, now now that we got some proper tools with the second one, it was pretty awesome to develop with it. So it was really faster. But but yeah, we we did the level editor after we finished the um, Grimrock one, and uh, I guess we launched it something like um, like ha half a year later when the first one came out. But now now with the Grimrock two, the level editor is. Is, is straight in the package with uh, from the launch. So it sounds like it's a lot easier than that old system with the yeah, text file. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and faster. Even I can do stuff with that, so it's, it's pretty cool. And I can say, uh, like, code to save my life, so... <laughs> I guess you guys are hoping that some a lot of folks will start making their own levels and releasing that sort yeah, of... Yeah, and there's, they're, all already content. Do, they're already doing it, so... Um, it's it's pretty cool. They did some amazing stuff for the first one already. Some some guys did did the uh, outside environments with with crazy hacking and cheating and stuff like that. So uh, it's the sky's the limit. <laughs> the original dungeon master was already done it with the first one. If I just remember correctly, but. Uh, I, I, at least there was some talk about it, but but you could, couldn't uh, drop the gate on on the on the monster because our our tile tile set is a bit different, so <laughs> that's that's going to be a missed uh, feature. 
I guess all of you guys must have played a lot of Dungeon Master uh, back in the day, right? Maybe the Eye of the Beholder games? Yeah, fun, funnily enough, um, I'm probably the, the only guy who, who hasn't played those games. I'm too young. Uh, but but um, our coder, Petri, and uh, level designer, Antti, they have uh, they, they, they love those games. And uh, uh, Petri especially is, I guess he, he thinks that um, done the first Dungeon Master is the greatest game ever, so, yeah, so, all that. so a, a, a lot of the inspiration coming from, or, or at least doing Grimrock was coming from Petri's um, enthusiasm of the, of the Dungeon Master. You know one thing, I, I'm kind of like you uh, with du uh, Dungeon Master as well. I wasn't, I, w I mean I was old enough to play it when it came out, but we didn't have the right computer. So I kept yeah. hearing about it. I actually had an Amiga, but it wasn't didn't have enough RAM yeah. to, to run the program. But uh, I, I didn't have any computers. I, I, my first machine was, I guess it was Nintendo NES. So I'm like a Mario generation, <laughs> let's say. Well, one thing I did notice about Dungeon Master, you know, because I was, I, was I was writing a book about the history of all the different computer role playing games, and a lot of these games, like the early Ultima series, and all of those. I mean the it was so. It was. It took so much work to, to play the game because you had to read the manuals and there, you know, they'd have a different button on the keyboard for all these different things you could do. I mean, it was kind of <laughs> bewildering. And uh, but when you get to Dungeon Master, suddenly that's you know that was very easy. Felt very natural. You know, I was able to get into that really right off the bat. It still has a lot of. Uh, it's still lots of fun to play now. Yeah, yeah. I, I gave it a try because I just wanted to know. Uh, what it, it, it was about all about so it's it was of course it's a hard game but but it's it was really uh, easy to to get along with it so um so we tried the same thing with uh grimrock you know um making it easy to access but hard to master I noticed you got some of the some of the critters from uh, Dungeon Master seem to be in the in the new game, especially the the mummies. <laughs> oh man, I just killed about a thousand mummies in that game last night. Man, there must have been a thousand mummies in that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, so how do you guys pack so much into these levels? I mean, it just you know I was reading some other reviews and it definitely. I had the same experience, you know, you think you've calmed this level through and then you're just casually going back and you're like, well, look, what is that? Is that a little button? I, how did I miss that button there? I mean, it's, it seems like you, you, if you're just kind of wandering around, you're only seeing about 10% of the world, right? <laughs> how much stuff do you have in there that's just hidden away? We, we tried to do, um, you know, like try to make the game feel like uh, it has multiple levels uh, besides the levels but but um, you know like um, so that there, there would be a replay value because it's a basically linear game but uh, with other uh, party um, uh, different party setups and stuff like that so uh, when you knew the main puzzles then you have like more processing power to to do the uh, so-called side quests, so so and uh, find find the extra secrets. So, so we we try to build players there. And um, I was wondering if you might have been inspired by games like Mist and Riven, because it feels a lot like that to me, especially the second one. Yeah, we, we, I guess most of us has played Mist at some point, and uh, uh, but. Um, we, at least consciously, we didn't try to copy anything. Uh, uh, this was just um, uh, mostly it was like an organic process of continuing from Grimrock 1. But it has uh, similarities like um, I have to Beholder 2 because it went outside also and uh, stuff like that. So, um, but I, I guess it's they had the same thought processes behind them, so I guess we we just ended up thinking like them. Yeah, I was wondering if, what the relationship is between this game and that Might and Magic Legacy game that came out not too long ago. 
Um, Do you know those guys, or is there, yeah, they're using yeah. they're using your engine, right? No, no, they they this their their own. No, no, but um, you mean they they just copied <laughs> that whole grid based uh, thing? Yeah, well, I would say that, but uh, they didn't they, license it. I thought they. Oh well, okay. It, it, it was their their own project, and uh, but we we are we are um, of course flattered that um, uh, Ubisoft uh, tried the genre. So um, maybe it was something to do with us with with success of Grunov One. And uh, they they managed to do something right and uh, something. <laughs> so, right. So, uh, I, I, we yeah, just, the only uh, thing they could do right is to copy you guys. So. <laughs> yeah. We tried the um, early version when it came out, so I I don't have. Uh, Are you guys like what the subject. hell is? <laughs> it, it, at the time, it was a bit broken, so it left kind of bad taste in your mouth. So, but I I heard that they fixed. Uh, fixed a lot of stuff but I, I never went back to it so I really enjoyed it I didn't realize that there was maybe some bad blood with you I, f- I thought they had actually licensed the engine from you or no, it, no there's no no black, bad blood so we are, we, are, we are happy that the uh, uh, genre is ex- expanding so we it's it's all good <laughs> yeah I was reading some of the interviews about the first game and you know one of the things that that struck me at the time was uh, wow I can't you know, it's not that I don't like the... I personally really enjoyed the game, but I didn't expect it to be as popular with other people. No, we You know, as it was, I would think there'd be a little niche of people that would really like it, you know. But it seems like that's... Uh, you guys were just sort of overwhelmed with sales, right? Yeah, we, we were just... When, when we launched, we were uh, broke, and we were just hoping to get our, our, our monies back. So we were counting, like, maybe if we sell... 5,000 copies, 10,000 copies, we would get uh, at least some, some, some of our savings back. So we were just uh, humbled when, when, when we started crossing the uh, 100K selling marks. So it, it, was, it was really cool and uh, nobody of us uh, expect, expected any, anything like that. How many copies did you end up selling? I mean, I guess it's still being sold now, but... Yeah, it's... it's selling some and uh, of course now now that the second one is out it's it's increased the selling a bit but um, I guess it was like a month ago when we crossed the 900,000 copies <laughs> wow yeah. so you can quit riding that bicycle and get a car now right <laughs> oh, nobody cares about cars <laughs> yeah. so you're not going to get the Ferrari or the... no no <laughs> the, there's so many middlemen <laughs> and uh Taxes and stuff like that <laughs> takes away the cash flow. <laughs> oh, I see. Yeah. Well, what about the? You know, what are your theories on why this game was so popular? Um, I I think personally that um, uh, we got so much hype because um. All the older guys were excited about it. So, and the uh, you know older uh, thirty plus male guys, yeah, <laughs> geriatrics. So, and and so and especially in the game journalists. So they they have um, had time to climb, you know, like to be like editors in chief. So we got got so much exposure of. Uh, in various media, so I think that that's because of the um, uh, it, it it brought back uh, fond memories to the uh, uh, guys who are who are in charge of what's get published and what's not. Plus, we got some some lucky lucky things like not tweeting us and ended up crashing our site like three times or some stuff like that. So, but again, uh, that's that's. That goes with the same same thing as uh, he he was fond of the dungeon master back in the day. So that's that's just my theory. Yeah, it makes you wonder how many more of these old games are out there that you know. People assume it's obsolete, but if they would just try it again, it might 
you know, there's something universal or timeless really about this kind of this kind of yeah, game. Yeah, yeah, and uh, there, there's there's a lot of um, uh, tile-based small games coming around, like like in uh, Kickstarter and uh, or 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 clones of Grimrock or stuff like that. So, uh, of course. I say clones, clones of Green Rock. <laughs> There's clones. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, how does, you know, we talked a little bit about this, but I was wondering if you could sort of give me a, some idea of how you guys work as a studio, as, as a team. I mean, you know, how do these, how are these, how are you putting these games together? Yeah. Um, basically, um, we are a really small team. So uh, there's four of us doing the Green Rock one, and uh, now there was seven. Uh, to do the second one, so it's still a really, really small team. So it's easy to talk and brainstorm without having um, to to do a meeting of changing uh, like color of one orb or stuff like that. So uh, it's 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 so much easier, and with the correct tools, we don't have any the um, Every change we do in the level is is um, uh, updated in the in the game right away. So um, you know, like compact team and uh, right pipeline allows us to move really really fast, and uh, we 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 concentrate on the really on the essentials of the game, and uh, we always think about um, would the game be better or worse with this feature or not. So everything gets reflected uh, on the game. So every personal opinion uh, is, is dampened uh, on, on, on that ground. So you guys, I guess you guys all gel pretty well. Or do you have disagreements from time to time about uh, of course. <laughs> aspects of the day? Yeah. But we, any, we any like really big debates that have come up? Uh, sometimes, yeah, but uh, it, it, it's it's normal when you're working with uh, creative and passionate people. So we try to be civil about it. And uh, uh, like I said, um, at the end of the day, we just think if 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 that's what the game needs, then then we'll do it. Or if if the game is worse with this feature, then we drop the feature. So, so the so what was one of those features that got dropped? Is that a um, curiosity? Actually, the uh, we went back and forth with the levels inside the levels. So um, uh, it it was really um, there was really a lot of work from coding standpoint point and uh, uh, and with the graphics naturally because we had to do so much more stuff there, but. Um, Luckily, we kept it because it made the game really much better. But so there was a lot of small things that um, um, we went through but skipped. Like um, uh, some of them were on the early stages of the game when we weren't totally so sure what the game was about. But when we uh, decided to go on the in, uh, on the island, it, it kind of um, helped us to do, de define the direction because before that we were thinking about cities and uh, NPCs and uh, roaming around the world doing quests. So oh, wow, you're going to have cities in there. Yeah, but that that was just ridiculous on a, on on so, so small sized team. So we 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 wanted to keep it compact and uh, really uh, uh, like like dense. Uh, levels like you said before and so there's we packed so much punch punch into those uh like like smaller areas to have it make it um more exciting and uh, uh fun to explore rather than you know running around in the wilderness for like hours without <laughs> encountering anything yeah i think that was the right idea you know personally because there's something about this island setting you know we saw the same thing and, and missed to some extent but it's just there's something about that world that makes you want to explore every nook and cranny right yeah and it's, <laughs> you it's don't always, feel bored going from point a to point b like you would in most games yeah and it's it's 
it's always with kind of island settings. They 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 like have a tendency of uh, adventure. Right. In I wonder if that's just sort of a biological thing, almost. With <laughs> probably, yeah, yeah, something like Gilligan's Island stuff. <laughs> That's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Should be back with the uh, second part of this interview with Yuho. Then I'm thinking of doing a, a little review of the second Legend of Grimrock game. Uh, but anyway, let me know what your ideas are, what you'd like to see. Always open to those suggestions. Keep them coming, guys. As always, I want to thank you very, very much for your continued support of the show. It really means a lot to me. Uh, if you would like to support the show and get access to all kinds of bonus material, uh, just follow the link in the show notes to the Patreon site. You can uh, subscribe at any level you feel comfortable with, a dollar, an episode, five dollars, uh, whatever. You can even set a monthly uh, budget on that too, so you don't have to worry about spending more than you thought. It's a really good system. I think you'll enjoy it. Uh, and while you're there, check out some of the other uh, Patreon sites. There's lots of uh, great stuff going on. Uh, but anyway, thank you very much for your support. All right, what about the news of the Matt Cave? Our news from the Matt Cave, rather. Uh, quite a bit of news, some good, some bad. I guess I'll start with the, the bad news. Uh, bad news is Augustin Cordez's uh, Kickstarter for the uh, case of Charles Dexter Ward. The, uh, Ch Charles Dexter Ward. Uh, this was a an officially licensed HP Lovecraft product. Uh, unfortunately, it has failed to make its Kickstarter goal. They were asking for 250k and uh, managed to reach about 110k. So it's not like a total failure or anything. Uh, but it is a shame. I was really, it looked like a very promising uh, game. They're trying to do something different with the HP Lovecraft franchise and the same old, uh, same old Cthulhu type stuff. Uh, looking at, at some of his other work, but uh, hopefully uh, Augustine won't take this too hard. And then we're still looking very much uh, forward to the Asylum game. All right, uh, another Kickstarter that's really interesting, particularly, uh, particularly, particularly, anyway, particularly for fans of the. Uh, mist style games and the sort of uh, more literary interactive fiction sort of genre. I'm not quite sure what to call this, but it's called Icebound, a novel of reconfiguration. This is another indie game. It's uh, com so They say it combines interactive story uh, with an augmented reality printed book. So it's kind of a neat project. You're kind of uh, crossing some lines there, crossing, blending some genres and media uh, together. It just looks kind of interesting to me. Uh, but anyway, that's, uh, I think they've already met their goal, but you could check it out. And it really doesn't cost that much if you want to get a copy of this thing. So uh, I encourage you to check it out. Also, the Grey Walkers uh, Purgatory game I've been talking about off and on, uh, that has a couple days left to go on their Kickstarter. They just barely made it. Uh, they were asking for 40K. Uh, they got actually 43K. And uh, hopefully, though, they got a couple more days and maybe they'll shoot up and hit some of their stretch goals. Really like to see that. Okay, also the Sid Meier Civilization Beyond Earth game has been out for a while. I uh, have not played it. Huge fan of Civ V. Uh, but the reviews I've been reading about the Beyond Earth are kind of mixed. I really, uh, you know, I've been told to wait for a special <laughs> before I pick it up. Uh, so anyway, I want to hear what your takes are on that game if you've played it already. Uh, you know, is it different enough from Civ Five to warrant the like, 40 bucks or $50, however much it costs? And then just a couple of little uh, personal notes. I just finished the uh, latest in the Nancy Drew series, Labyrinth of Lies. I highly recommend that. Um, also finished uh, Legend of Grimrock 2. I'll, do you my, uh, I'll show you my review of that later. Uh, but for now, just say I thought it was awesome. Also, I've been playing a little game called Legends of Shulama, or I'm sorry, Lords of Shulama. Uh, it's a little indie RPG. They kickstarted kick started it a while back. Made a, They just released it. Having quite a bit of fun with it, actually. Maybe I'll do a, a review of that, too. Okay, I think that's it for the news. Uh, so what about that Ale of the Week? Well, this week I've got another selection from Christian Hallstrand, uh, courtesy of Tor Ivaroth. Uh, this is the Lufsta APA American Pale Ale. Now, apparently I had a little bit wrong last time, uh, so... Uh, Christian wrote in to uh, correct me on a couple things. So, star coal, there's the word star coal here on this bottle. Apparently that just means strong ale, aka good ale. And the name of the brewery is Lufstabruck 
Bridgery, <laughs> Briggery, <laughs> looks a little bit like brewery. AB, I'm not sure what the AB stands for. Uh, this says it has 4.8%, um, I guess that's 4.8% alcohol, so uh, this one's not very strong. So, <laughs> uh, let's see, what else do we have? Anything interesting here? Maybe it's a, they thought it was an American pale ale, so they had to make it a little weaker. Um, let's see, it said something about the logo here. Okay, so this logo here on the bottle, apparently that is derived from the the stamp from the Lufsta Lufsta Ironworks used to stamp this on ingots. I guess I can see that now. I guess that's why there's a little gap there in the uh, ring around it. Anyway, kind of interesting history. I don't know much about this part of the world. I'd love to get over there uh, someday <laughs> and try it out because I can. I still cannot read this. Oh, there's a, something I recognize. Uh, Columbus Tomahawk. <laughs> I don't know why that's. <laughs> I don't know why that's on this bottle. Uh, what the hell is it? Columbus Tomahawk. Anyway, let's get this Tomahawk open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this Lufsta American Pale Ale, APA. And I still think it's kind of a trip. You know, I'm used to tasting uh, American microbrews that are trying to uh, taste like ales from Belgium or Germany or Austria, you know, or, any of the, or England. You know, the country's really known for ale. Um, this is the first time that I ever think that I've had a, a beer from another country that was trying to be more American. <laughs> Not sure why they would even want to do that, but uh, anyway. <sighs> Smelling this one, I definitely smell the, the hops in this. You know, maybe that tomahawk is a type of hops. <laughs> the Columbus, uh, Columbus tomahawk. But it's not really a real strong aroma here. It's nothing is uh, bowling me over or anything. It's kind of a light, a light aroma. Um, it's about, you know, about all I can say about it. So uh, let me give it a taste. Uh, Taste-wise, it's not bitter at all. You don't taste any alcohol, any alcoholic flavor. Just sort of a, sort of refreshing with some hops in the aftertaste. Really, you get more of the taste after you have swallowed. Start to taste some of those hops. Let me try it again. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's a pleasant flavor. It's uh, a little bit more complex, say, than a, oh, I don't know, like a Sam, Sam Adams or a, uh, not Sam Adams. Yeah, I think it is Sam Adams that does the, uh, uh, the American Pale Ales. It's uh, not bad. I will say I prefer the one from last week uh, to this one. I usually like a little bit more punch uh, to my beers. You know, I like the strong ales. <laughs> what can I say? Uh, this one, though, is... Uh, uh, this one, you know, it's very lightly flavored, so I guess this would be good if you want to have a, you know, uh, if you want to concentrate on your meal, maybe, or you want to have a barbecue, or you want to have a, a bunch of beers instead of just one or two. Uh, you know, this one, the uh, lower alcohol content would make this uh, more ideal. Uh, so if you're looking for a lighter beer and a, an American <laughs> pale ale, uh, this one's definitely up there. Uh, however, uh, if you're looking for something stronger with a bit more punch, you probably want to go somewhere else. So anyway, I'm going to give this one a four out of five drinking horns. It's uh, very good for what it is. Uh, I can't really, t <laughs> I, I guess it, maybe it is uh, very American if you're looking for something more American in your uh, pale ales. But anyway, four out of five drinking horns, I think we'll sum that up. All right, now for the uh, quotation of the week, I was looking around uh, for quotations and I uh, found a poem actually. I, mean, I don't usually read poems, they're a little too long. And usually by this point of the show, I'm ready to, uh, <laughs> to call it a day. Uh, but this, this poem just, uh, you know, it really worked for me. And I, I think it says, it's kind of spoke to me, I guess. And, uh, this is Ambrose Beers. I really like the name uh, Beers. <laughs> Uh, anyway, uh, the name of the poem is A Mute and Glorious Milton. And it goes something like this. Oh, I'm the unaverage man, but you never have heard of me. For my brother, the average man, outran my fame with rapidity. And I'm sunk in oblivion sea. But my bully big brother the world can span with his wide notoriety. I do everything that I can to make him attend to me, but the papers ignore the unaverage man with a weird uniformity. So saying with a dolorous note, 
a voice that I heard from the beach. On the sable waters it seemed to float like a mortal part of speech. The sea was oblivion sea, and I cried as I plunged to swim. The unaverage man shall reside with me, but he didn't. I stayed with him. <laughs> See you guys next week. I was swaying, milk to my ears to a pot of feather stew. I flogged the one I snake did my sausage. I made the bald man cry into the turtle's stew, which I do believe my 